Welcome to the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of melody makers. My name is Arthur Brewer. I am a composer and I am your host today. I am very excited today because we're going to be talking about a melody that was one of the first two melodies that inspired this podcast. Today I have as my guest, composer Zachary Davies. Zachary Davies is a composer, pianist, and podcaster based in London, recently graduated from King's College, London. During his time there, he studied piano with John Reed at the Royal Academy of Music. As a composer, he writes regularly for soloists, ensembles, and societies within the university, and has studied with Thomas Hyde and Samuel Andreev. As a pianist, he's performed at a diverse range of venues, from the Guildhall to the Bull's Head Jazz Room, and has taken part in masterclasses with Charles Owen, David Cyrus, and Alexander Dariescu. Zachary founded the Euterpian Podcast in 2020. Welcome to the Melodology Podcast, Zachary. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And may I call you Zach? You absolutely may call me Zach. <laughs> All right. Tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background with music? I'd say I started piano at around the age of five, but it was only around the age of 12 that something happened. Uh, the spark was ignited when I temporarily moved next door to a semi-retired jazz musician. And he showed me a more creative process behind music and, and music making that helped me bring together both my love of classical piano and composition. And so I suppose, although I'm still more of a classical pianist, classical composer, uh, whatever that means, uh, jazz has been, jazz and blues have, have been an extremely important influence in my musical formation. And I think that's, that's reflected still in, in the music that I write and the music that I love to play and listen to. What are your earliest memories of melodies, any melodies in particular? It's strange, you know, I was thinking about this and when I was young, I mean, there were, even then, it was still pre-streaming, but there was such an abundance of melodies that I, I struggled to discern just one. However, from that second period of my musical life, when I was introduced to jazz, there is a melody. So I thought I would choose that. And it's St. James Infirmary. I think it's by Joe Primrose. And it's a, an eight bar blues. And I just fell in love with it. I fell in love with how you could improvise over it and the lyrics and, and all of it. And it, it really opened the door to music for me. So I, I, I think I'll go with that melody. And of course, I always ask, are you a film score fan? Oh, absolutely. You know, I think film scores also held a, a, a very important part of my musical formation, particularly when listening to more orchestral music. You know, I listen to a lot of piano music because I'm a pianist. And as a pianist, sometimes we get stuck in our world of 88 keys. And I think that film, film music is, is really excellent in that it exposes us very often to a full orchestra. and I think if I were to, to give a, a key film composer influence, it would have to be Ennio Morricone. Mm. We're going to be talking about a very famous melody today. And, but I, when I reached out to you, I was almost tempted to go with a Morricone melody. But I just thought, no, I've got to go with the one we're going with because I can speak more about it and I, I play it a lot more on the piano. But I think Morricone is, is, was an exceptional film composer. I, I, I know he's really appreciated in, in Europe. I, I don't know what his fan base is like in, in America. Yeah, with film score fans, he is absolutely really well known. And I think part of his part of his fame and his mystique is that he's known for working with whatever he had available to work with when he was creating music. If he had zero budget, mm. he was able to create a really fantastic score with just a couple of instruments and a person whistling. Yes. So he was, he was completely flexible that way and completely creative when he needed to fit within restrictions. But also he has so many famous scores from big movies 
but he's he's known also for those sweeping melodies and mm. those memorable romantic sounding melodies. Yes, I mean everything from the mission. Uh, obviously, a lot of the spaghetti westerns. He hated that term, apparently. Oh, yeah. I mentioned the whistles. Yes, of course, of course. But I also feel that he was experimental in many ways. In the in the you know American term of exploring form, and that there are several scores where he would improvise the cues for his uh, contemporary improvisation <laughs> ensemble, but. Also, in, in his choice of instrumentation, as you say, is extremely creative. If he needed to use a whistle or a whip sound, or even uh, there was a fabulous documentary that just came out about his music, about his life. And even in the Once Upon a Time, is it Once Upon a Time in the West? I think it is. There's no music for the, for the first 20 minutes. And he was inspired, in other words, just to let the soundtrack be the noises of the set. By music concrete, you know he he was really uh, and and he persuaded um, a lot of the directors to go along with him. Um, I know I have deep affection for his music. I think it's brilliant. Well, today's melody is from a movie. It's a song from a movie, and it's from an older movie, the original Wizard of Oz, which I think a lot of people have only ever seen on television. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand how kind of beautiful a movie and how amazing a movie The Wizard of Oz was to many people, with it being one of the earlier movies to have lots and lots of color. Mm. And they go from the black and white scenes of Kansas at the beginning to full color in Oz. And the music was written for the film. The songs were written for the film, and they were written in some cases with the directing and the actual visuals of the movie in mind. The song we're going to be talking about today, of course, is Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which is, again, one of the two melodies that inspired this podcast in the first place. And when I think about a melody that is an iconic melody, a melody that somebody can hum and remember, and that inspires, and that makes you, you know, makes you feel things. This is one of the first melodies that comes to mind, and one of the first moments in a movie or a mo you know, moment in a story that comes to mind to me. So let me read a little bit about Over the Rainbow. Over the Rainbow is a ballad by Harold Arlen with lyrics by Yip Harburg. It was written for the 1939 film The Wizard of Oz, in which it was sung by actress Judy Garland in her starring role as Dorothy Gale. It won the Academy Award for Best Original Song and became Garland's signature song. Composer Harold Arlen and lyricist Yip Harburg often worked in tandem, Harburg generally suggesting an idea or title for Arlen to set to music before Harburg contributed the lyrics. For their work together on The Wizard of Oz, Harburg claimed that his inspiration was a ballad for a little girl who was in trouble and wanted to get away from Kansas, a dry, arid, colorless place. She had never seen anything colorful in her life except the rainbow. Arlen decided the idea needed a melody with a long, broad line. Arlen wrote the contrasting bridge section based on the idea of a child's piano exercise. Over the Rainbow was given the Towering Song Award by the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2014. In March 2017, Over the Rainbow, sung by Judy Garland, was entered in the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress as music that is culturally, historically, or artistically significant. The Recording Industry Association of America and the National Endowment for the Arts ranked it number one on their Songs of the Century list. The American Film Institute named it the best movie song on the AFI's 100 Years, 100 Songs list. Talk about a pedigree. <laughs> Talk about uh, really a <clears throat> soaring representation of melody. Absolutely. I mean, even that description leaves me speechless. I mean, its impact on popular culture is enormous. It's also certainly has a presence within jazz culture. An enormous amount of jazz pianists have taken it and made it their own as well. Uh, it's, it's 
It's an extremely iconic melody and the craft behind it uh, is so simple. And yet I think that's what makes it perfect, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that. Do you remember when you first either heard the melody or saw the movie? I think I was obsessed with this film when I was about four or five, something around that. So it's been many years <laughs> that I've, uh, I've known the melody. And it was about six months ago that I, I heard a recording of, firstly, of Dave Brubeck playing it, and then of Keith Jarrett playing it. And I thought, wow, I mean, they do all kinds of things to the melody, and yet it's so identifiable. Still, despite all the melodic transformations, manipulations, all that kind of thing. And I thought it's such a, a strong melody. You could, you could throw rats at the melody and it would still sound <laughs> like over the rainbow, right? So I, it, it really I think, got I me. I think Disney probably has, or the Muppets probably yeah. <laughs> have, literally thrown rats at the melody. Uh, I can see oh, that I being something. Yeah, I, I don't doubt it. It would make a very funny sketch, I'm sure. Um, and that, that got my curiosity going because I thought, well, it, if you can do so much the melody and yet it retains its character, its rhetoric and how it feels, there's something behind it that's worth exploring. And that's the, when, when I saw your tweet asking for melodies, I thought, that's the one I have to go for. That's the melody I have to choose. Well, like I had said, this is one of two melodies that are so iconic to me that I thought about creating this podcast around them. And they are both the same kind of song. They're both the Wishing on a Star or yeah. Over the Rainbow song, because the other one is When You Wish Upon a Star. So that's another melody that I really want to look at as well. And this particular song, like you said, the, the melody is extremely simple, but it's very, very solid. And there's a lot that goes on kind of behind it with the chords and so forth, but the melody stands alone all by itself. You can sing it and you can completely understand everything about where the chords are behind it. You understand the harmony and the chord progressions just from the way the melody fits into the chords all by itself. It's not vague in any way where the notes land as you're singing it. Absolutely. I, I think that the, as you say, the melody connotes the harmony in, in such a way it's it's almost like a, a piece for solo violin by Bach in a way, you know, it, it, in that it, it's a single line, but you can see the contour of the the harmonic shapes and all that through the melody. And so, as you say, it's, it stands alone by itself, which is it, itself remarkable for something so melodic, whereas Bach very often would compose polyphonically but for one instrument, you know, you just have several lines going on at once. Whereas here we have a melodic contour with a single melody. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a break. And then we will come back and take a look at and a listen to Over the Rainbow. Welcome back to the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of melody makers. I am your host, Arthur Brewer, and I am here today with composer Zachary Davies. We are talking about Over the Rainbow. We're going to do the same thing we usually do. Now, we are looking at the melody, so if you would like to see what it is we're looking at, we are on Patreon, so Patreon patrons can also see the videos of what it is we're looking at. We're also going to play the melody so you can hear it, but sometimes seeing it along with us makes it easier to understand what it is we're talking about. And we're going to walk along the melody as if we've never seen it before, and we're just going to talk about what it is that we see and what it is that we're discovering looking at it as we go. So here we go. Let's listen to the very first part. And in this case, I'm only going to play the first two measures of this melody for us to take a look at. Zachary, what do you see so far in the melody? Well, I think you have to talk about the first two notes. And just how daring and clever those first two notes are. I mean, it's a full octave that starts us off, but also it's, it's very bold. It's not like a, an upbeat that goes into an octave higher. It's one note in the first beat of the bar and in the third beat of the bar, another note. So it, it gives us a certain 
boldness of, of color as well, just in that octave going really high. How about you? What, what do you, what do you yeah, see? The, again, that just what you said, that first octave, first of all, we've talked about when you're writing a song, you can have things that sound conversational and therefore they might not land on a downbeat and an emphasis is a downbeat. And if you're talking conversationally, it's the important thing that lands on the downbeat. And a lot of songs, they don't land on a downbeat until you get to some important point. On this song, the most important point seems to be right at the very beginning, somewhere, that long leap octave. And it, it represents, you know, I would think kind of exploring because you're going as far as you can go within a scale without leaping up to one of the notes that you've already passed. And it's also curiously starting out right on the tonic note. So it's sort of not necessarily starting out as if it's exploring, but it still comes across just those two notes because the second note's actually on the sixth chord. So it's landing an octave up, but it's not solid when it gets to the octave up. It's at that point that it becomes searching. But yeah, it's very solid, very strong and assertive opening for the song. I agree. And I think in terms of the setting of the text and you know the word painting, that the fact that those first two notes are on the word somewhere evokes all kinds of mystery, really, I, I think, as well. Just it, it could have been done in so many different ways, but this is so striking. It really draws you in as a listener, I think. And then we have the second measure, which is distinctive rhythm the first measure we have just two notes landing on one and three and then the second measure we have da 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 so we've got four beats the second beat is broken into two eighth notes and this kind of pattern of a short leap down and then walking back up it's a distinctive pattern and it's the only real rhythm that we have so far mm. yes and Later on, when we've explored the whole melody, rhythm is something I'd like to come back to, uh, because I think that, that in terms of rhythmic diversity, there, there isn't actually that much in this melody, which could be what creates this certain boldness and this quality that we mentioned before about being able to manipulate it, and yet it's still recognizable. It's, it's very much in bold colors, I think. Well, let's go ahead and play the first four measures of the melody. What are you noticing as the melody continues? Well, it's in two chunks, as it were. You, you have a first statement and then a, and then a second statement. I think the, the first statement, you could argue, ends not quite sure of what's going on. And then the second one is like a, an answer, ending on the, the G minor, which in this case is the minor third, right? So three of the, of the key. So it's interesting that we feel like there's some kind of answer, even though we're not on the tonic at the end of these four bars. You pointed out that it's kind of two chunks. You have the leap of somewhere, those first two notes, and then in the third measure, we have way up. The first one starts out as a leap of an octave. The second one's a leap of a sixth. And the first thing that immediately jumps out to my mind is the melody after this huge leap upward is starting to walk back down the scale. Yes. First measure, we leap all the way up to the high E flat. The next note is D, and it kind of peaks back up and jumps up just a tiny little bit back up to the E flat, but then drops down the octave. We have that sixth leap up, and that sixth takes us up to C. So now we've gone from E flat to D down to C, and then it lands at the end of this phrase on the B flat although it's not landing on a strong five chord. It's not actually landing on a dominant chord that would want to take us back to one so solidly. But the melody has leapt up from its lowest point so far and is gradually coming back down. I think something to add, I mean, that's a, a brilliant point, uh, sort of a, s a structural observation about, about the melody. Uh, and I would add also that in, in, in a similar kind of sense, 
that it starts with a, an E flat at a certain pitch. In a way, I could really hear that E flat staying with us until the third bar and going into the next bar. It's almost like a, a pedal. I know the chords change, but there's a certain persistence about the E flat being the start of the phrase that when it changes is very effective. So it's, even though it's not written throughout, there's, there's a significance about always coming back to that E flat until we then go somewhere else, which is later in the melody. Just coming up. Yeah. And I think part of that is it's the lowest note and we do come back to that note in the third measure. Again, solidly on the downbeat, we hit that E flat, that low E flat again, establishing that particular note as sort of the foundation that we are landing on, that we're working on here. That even though this, you know, these four measures go leaping up and climbing back down, there really is, the ground is still there. The foundation of the melody is still at that spot. Indeed. Shall we go a little bit farther? Yes, 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 certainly. I'm going to play the first part again, just because I love this melody so much. And we'll go in through the second phrase as well. Right, so now that we're in the second half of the part that really is the melody of Over the Rainbow, what are you noticing about this next stretch? Well, there are several similarities, of course, with the, to the opening first four bars, except here at the beginning we have a, a sixth, except it starts on a C rather than an E flat. And this, I think, is, is, is really a moment of, of reverie. Dorothy is in a state of dreaming really um, about what could be and where she goes uh, there's a land that I've heard of is is a place we hadn't been before and then of course after that we have that rhythmic change that we had before except it's now put into a, a descending sequence and as you observed this still continues with a, a structural descending scale by which I mean, you know, it's gone now a B flat, then A flat, then G, then F, and then back to E flat. So I mean, it's really soaring. You could you could take out the, the the key note for each bar, and it would just be a descending E flat major scale. So it's structurally brilliant as well in its craft. And just for people who aren't necessarily familiar with terms for composing or songwriting, when we're talking about a sequence, that essentially means an arrangement of notes or rhythms that are being repeated that we've heard once and they're repeated some way again later. And in this case, the sequence of notes is this part right here, starts up here. And then we have that repeated twice, the same exact arrangements of notes. Repeating a motif makes us remember something. In this case, I find it amazing that the the sequence repeats towards the end, it doesn't repeat at the beginning, so it hasn't really necessarily been established yet right at the beginning of the melody that this is going to be kind of a, a hook or a part of the thing that makes you remember the melody, but then it's repeated twice in the second phrase. And it's repeated without any variation in it, and it's all that's happening is it's dropping lower and lower as it goes. When we looked at the Rainbow Connection, Part of the magic of the rainbow connection is that the melody is constantly kind of searching for where it wants to be and never getting there. And then when you find the rainbow connection, there's a surprise with an accidental in the melody. Wow, there's this sudden change in the melody. And in this case, we're starting on the tonic. We are halfway through on the fifth note of the scale. And then at the very end, we're back at the tonic. So it's musically and lyrically, it's almost as if the longing is there, but the longing is still to be home and that this magic place that we're imagining is home or we want it to be home. Mm. Am, I, am I being too mystical about that as far as the way that melody works? No, I think I'm on board with you. I think that there's a lot of symbolism 
behind the melody and how it operates. And to put it in the context of the film, of course, it's at this point, I believe it's still in black and white. Uh, yes. It's only when she goes off to another land, the land that she's talking about, that the color uh, arrives. And I think that the harmony suggested by the melody as well is almost predicting or foreseeing, let's say, the color that's about to come, but with a lens of uh, wishing, sadness, melancholy, as you say. So it's, it's, it's complicated in the rhetoric of the melody and how it transports us to the world of, of Dorothy. Now, in the official song, there's a completely different melody at the beginning of this that isn't sung in the film. It's not used in the film at all. And I really think that anybody who has not heard multiple versions of the song probably wouldn't even be able to hum that intro melody. The film, curiously, starts right with her singing this. And this is one of those situations where the melody, to me, it, it's almost like it's a backward structure. Because a lot of times in songs, the verse is the part that is less memorable than the chorus. The ver you know you have a verse and then a chorus and a verse and a chorus and so forth like that. This song has two verses and then a bridge and then it comes back basically to the the main melody again. Uh, and there's a repeat written into it, so you can actually you can have the uh, the bridge part in there twice, but it just is a repeat of the bridge and the melody. The main melody. So I find it really interesting in this case that the song starts out, opens up with the iconic part of the piece. It opens up with the longing part of the piece and the heavy part of the piece. And then when you get the bridge, it kind of takes a little break from there. We have the first verse and then we have the second verse. I'm going to go ahead and just play through the second verse. It's exactly the same melody as before. The words are a little different. But it is the same melody, note for note, exactly a second time. So, two verses now. And you've repeated exactly the same melody. You've firmly established that people are going to remember the different parts of this melody. It has just an iconic leap at the beginning of an octave. And then each time it repeats the leap, it's leaping up a sixth. And the whole thing is going down a scale as it goes. In songwriting terms, this is something that people now will really solidly have the idea of what the melody and what the elements of the melody are in their mind. So I think when we get to the bridge, which of course this is the part that in, you know, in the description and the history of it, that Harold Arlen was saying he thought about this as being a child's piano exercise. And as soon as he said that, I'm like, oh yeah, we're back to just playing very, very simple repeating notes as if it is a beginning piano student just repeating how to play certain notes here. So I'm just going to play the very first part of the bridge and we can talk about what we're seeing here in terms of the music and the structure. What are your thoughts on this? Well, as you say, it's very much a piano exercise. <laughs> uh, but I think that its role within the song is also fascinating. I mean, we talked about the descending scale going throughout the, the verse. And now... I think you could also argue that it's it's now ascending. I mean, we have a, a B flat on the top, but we've it starts with the lowest note as a G, and then it goes to A flat. We've got the B flat, and then it the end of the first phrase is a C. So it's it's sort of like a mirror of the opening phrase. I think also that the childlike element of it reflects perhaps a certain youthfulness, a certain wishing for the future that is certainly within Dorothy's character. What's strange, I, I think that the verse and, the, and, and this bridge sort of explore different sides to her personality. The first may be what she's 
dreaming of, and the second is somehow a more objective look at what she's saying. It's less sentimental somehow. Not sentimental in a, a bad way, of course. I love the first melody, but emotional, perhaps. It's, it's, it's very simple. There's something about it when I hear this part and, when, and even looking at it, it's reminding me kind of of birdsong, or at least how music represents birdsong. So the, sort of the idea of flying upward, of nature and beauty, those things seem to be kind of represented in this, as well as a little bit of a repetitiveness. Maybe the repetitiveness is the idea of things being mundane, but if they're being repetitive and mundane, we are gradually moving upward. And going back to, of course, I can't resist, but going back to talk about the rainbow connection, the rainbow connection has that section in it where it has alternating notes like this as well before you get to the chorus of the rainbow connection. That was something that I don't know if it was intentionally borrowed or emulated in rainbow connection, but you have this kind of alternating note, like things aren't stable, things aren't settled. And again, to me, very much seems reflective of musical works that are representing mourning, as in mourning in the day, or representing nature. Mm. Yeah, I certainly empathize with that. Let's go ahead and play that through, and we'll go all the way through the rest of the bridge area, and we can talk about what we see there. is kind of the most active that this melody gets. Mm. And as you'd seen before, we're going back down and working our way up. So we start with the lowest note being the G. This case, the next note up is an A natural. So we have the first accidental in the entire song, the first kind of taking us out of the key. And it also is going a little bit higher because rather than the next note up being the B flat there, we've gone up to a C and then we go up to a D and leap all the way up to a high F, which is the highest note in the whole piece. So we've reached past the high note that we get to in that first octave leap and melodically rather than dropping down the scale or the, the notes that we're going through are moving upward. Yes, I mean, as you say, and as I alluded to earlier, this is almost then like a, a structural mirror to the opening phrases, you know, it's, it's ascending. And as you point out, that high F is the highest point of the whole song. And I think whenever analysing music, the question is always, why there? <laughs> you know, why, <laughs> why there? And leading up for the lyrics, of course, where you'll find me. And I think this is maybe the, the pinnacle of hope in the song, the pinnacle of expression and, you know, the, the, the kind of modulatory passage just before builds up that tension as well with that A natural that you mentioned. I'm not sure whether I call it a, a climax. I, I, I feel like it is, but I think because there's another, uh, the return of the opening verse to come, I, I'm not sure I, I label it that technically, it, but I yeah. think it certainly feels like that when you're listening to it in real time. I would agree that, and, and performance wise, when this is sung, I think people are inclined to put the climax of the piece at that next beginning of the main melody. The somewhere, again, that's the most important point again. So this is, it's as if it's a climax and, and melodically we've reached the highest note, but I think emotionally, we maybe haven't reached the, the real emotional point until we get back to that somewhere that's after this phrase. Yeah. As something I just noticed there is, of course, the, the implied harmony and the, the actual harmony there, of course, um, is essentially an enormous perfect cadence <laughs> um, and leading in to that return of the opening phrase. And so, as you say, although that high F is the highest F, it's, it's sort of building up the energy until we get to that E flat again, which uh, which is an enormous five one. Right. Well, and we've done sort of a 
secondary dominant going up to the B flat to mm. get to that B flat from some F and F six sort of chords uh, on the where you'll find me. But interesting. Also, they avoid the E flat completely in this stretch. So even though the melody, if you were to go up step by step in the scale, you'd be going up G A. There's no B in here, but you can jump up, skips up to the C and D. It doesn't hit the E flat on the way up to the F. It jumps over it. Yes, I think that's a certainly a point to consider because the voice leading has been so suggestive all the way through that to have a break of what is it a, a minor third in the scale is definitely a conscious decision by the composer. It's just a case of how we how we interpret that decision. I think emotionally, whether we realize it or not, I would guess that we are noticing that gap that we actually haven't touched home there again. And it's adding some tension to get to that note mm. when we finally get to that note two measures later. There is no E flat at all in the bridge. No. So not only there, but the entire bridge omits the note E flat. So I think that when we get back to that E flat, there's a certain special quality and release of tension that we have when we hear it. I mean, that's certainly my perspective on it. Well, and the main melody is so focused on the E flat that it is curious that it's completely missing. I mean, the harmonies are on E flat. So we're still yes. yeah. curiously, there's, we're not straying at the beginning of the bridge. We're not straying immediately away from the main chord of the entire song, which is E flat. <laughs> I can just imagine all, you know, I've had so many comments on my composing and I'm on, on which chord progressions I use and how I arrange the harmonies throughout an entire piece. And I can imagine somebody just looking at these chords and looking at the melody and saying, well, I think in the bridge, you probably should, you know, you should be in a different key than E flat. I think you should, mm. you know, you should drop down to the dominant or drop down to the subdominant, drop down to the four chord or the five chord and be someplace different, or even, you know, go all out and be like on the flat six so that the bridge is different. And I can, yeah. <laughs> from my experience of people critiquing or giving advice on composition, I can hear them saying, you should have the bridge start out someplace different. In this case, the bridge starts out also on E flat and it strays away from there in the second repeat, mm. but it's, it's the whole song still does have this big st very solid focus on E flat, which your observation that there is no E flat in the melody in the entire bridge, in this entire alternate section, it really stands out thinking mm. in those terms. Because the piece only strays away from the key of E flat when it does this sort of secondary dominant thing to get to B flat, which of course yes. is the dominant to E flat to bring us back to the E flat. The only time it strays is so that there is tension to get back to the E flat in the first place. Mm. I mean, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be awful if it was a <laughs> you know, a kind of Alberti bass? Is it would be someday I wish upon us. I mean, you know, it, yeah, it, when you put be... it in those terms, we we sort of pressure <laughs> testing it now. Um, and if you, as I just did there, I, I, I decided to make it a sort of Alberti bass. I think that the, the absence of the E flat gives a certain buoyancy. It makes the melody float, as you said at the beginning of this uh, section of the melody. Without the E flat, it, it, it floats. And with it, it just, it, it's awful. So I can see why they omitted it. And also, as you say, the slightly modulatory passage leading up to that B flat chord. I think is the most harmonic action we get on a way above the chimney tops, that, that section. Go ahead yeah. and indulge me here. Play that through. But when it gets to the words where you'll find me, play the E flat there. <laughs> so play, start with where troubles melt. That's the second part of the bridge. Yeah, I, I think for a couple different things going on, the leap 
makes the F, even though it's a short leap, the leap makes the F stronger. It makes it a leap versus just being a step up. Mm, certainly. And, and yeah, it's and less predictable other, as well. Yeah. In other melodies that we've looked at, for example, the force theme by John Williams, he leaps up the chord, but he leaps up by then dropping down and leaping up a larger interval. And that leap is what makes the 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 higher note seem like it's been more of a challenge to get to. In this case, we have the same sort of thing. We have just it's just a third. It's just two steps away. But it's still a leap. And that leap, I think, is what gives the drama to that high F. Absolutely. I I I I'm on board with that. I also just noticed that the um the register, the, the the range between the lowest and the highest note within the bridge is is really rather different to the opening part of the melody. I mean, it goes down to a G, and the highest note is an F, so that's a a seventh, which again is much more confined to the is it a minor tenth, something like that, <laughs> within the the main melody. So it's yeah. it is it's a dramatic difference there, and. The the leaps within the melody itself, I mean, there are no large leaps. The range is smaller, but there are no leaps that are larger than a third throughout the main part of the bridge. And then when you get to the very last section, you have a leap of a fourth downward. Mm. There's nothing that's a larger leap than a third in the entire bridge. Yes. I mean, in, in weirdly, I just thought in operatic terms, this is really rather like a recitative, isn't it? It's, I mean, it's... It's, it's a lot of speech. It's a lot of text. It's, it's much more uh, conversational than the uh, in, in rhythm and tone and everything compared to the, the opening melody. And what's striking about it is, as you say, I mean, it's in the middle of the song. I mean, usually in opera and the opera tradition and, and the musical theatre tradition as well, you'd have a, a very distinct difference between what you might call the recit or the introduction and the aria or the main song where they're expressing their emotions. So for the, what you might call a recit, <laughs> recitative portion to be in the middle is, is quite unusual, I think. I think it works and it is really suitable here because the main melody is so soaring. And in the main melody, you only have ever two eighth notes at the same time, and they're mm. mostly far apart from each other. So yeah. the largest quantity of time is taken up with half notes, with two beats per note in the, in the first section of the, the melody, in the main melody. So when you get to the bridge, one way that it's contrasting is by having this very fast rhythm, where basically every note that we're starting out with is, is one quarter as long as the first notes that we had in the entire piece. And you can get a lot more words in there, you can say a little bit more about what's going on. Uh, a long soaring melody is great, but it doesn't give you lots of space for words. Mm. Indeed. Uh, so they get, they get through a lot of words here. And I was also just thinking, as you said, that because the main melody is so soaring and so powerful, that if this bridge were to also have a lot of uh, complexity about it, melodically speaking, intervallically, and all the rest of it, it may even take away from the special mystery behind the opening melody. It's the simplicity, it's the contrast of this bridge that I think also re-emphasizes just how special the opening uh, and returning melody is, uh, the contrast. I also noticed just now that the bridge, the first phrase in the bridge starts out on E flat as far as the chord. So it's starting out on the home chord. And it ends on the home chord, but it's an E flat six because the melody isn't landing on a note within the chord. The melody mm. is outside of the home chord landing on that C, which is an interesting choice in and of itself. Sort of a jazzy choice to have the main note of the melody landing on a sixth or a seventh. But then the second time, or the second phrase of the bridge, you have that high F, but you come back and you land on the C again, which isn't in the dominant chord. It's not in the B flat chord. Mm. It's a ninth. 
It's one step above the, the main note of the B flat yeah. chord. So it's still, even though you're in that chord, that note is still not belonging to the chord. So we could use another allegory there, another metaphor that the, mm. where this bridge is landing, it isn't where it belongs, so to speak. It isn't part of the foundation around it. And I think it's this harmonic ambiguity, complexity that appeals to a lot of the, the jazz musicians I mentioned who've played it. I think that, I mean, as you said, landing on the sixth or the seventh is a very jazzy thing to do. No doubt, perhaps influenced by the American songbook and musical theater and that kind of thing. I mean, that C, just before the return of the uh, Somewhere of the Rainbow, I mean, the fact that it's not a, a D natural, I mean, maybe I should just experiment. What if I didn't go to the C? What if, what if the performer went to a D or a B flat, something on the key, on the chord? Would, would, that, would that take away something, perhaps? Maybe I could, maybe I could experiment with that. This there's it's, something not quite as good about it somehow. Yeah, I, it's it really is surprising. We did this with, with the Rainbow Connection too, where we took out the little accidental that happens when you get to the the magic moment when you get to the Rainbow Connection, and it does make the piece feel less bubbly and less exciting. And here again, there's not an accidental on that note, but it, because it's not part of that chord it stands out, I think, more, and it doesn't feel established. It doesn't feel traditional. Uh, mm. And I think because it does stand out, it makes it, I, I think it kind of makes that moment still where we're not quite at what we've talked about as being the emotional climax of the piece, which is the next two notes after these. Yes. So I think it does add its own sparkle there. It isn't mundane. It isn't what you'd expect. So even though it's not an accidental, it still stands out and shines. Mm, absolutely. And I think when I played a B flat there instead of a C, what you had was an F. Oh, sorry, just an octave up. Mm. Which in itself, I, I think just having two open fifths next to each other isn't as creative as, say, having... A fourth, and then a, a, a major sixth descending. I think that descending major sixth is is very powerful, but you don't you don't realize it until you change it around and explore. Yeah, and I'll throw a little bit of music physics in there. Uh, any note, just say a, a length of a guitar string, you can pluck that guitar string, and if it's vibrating in you know one stretch, just one big wave across the entire length of that string, you get one note. If you manage to make that wave into two pieces, so it, it's actually two waves fitting into that string, it's an octave up. If you make it into three waves that fit all within that same string, so it goes up and down and back up, you're playing the fifth. So there's a fifth interval that's just naturally part of every single note. And I kind of think that in the physics terms of that being fifths down, because they all fit and because they are all related to each other like that, it makes that C stand out mm. more and it makes the B flat disappear in the melody there when you're going from the F down to the B flat down to the E flat. Yes, agreed. I think that definitely affects our perception of it, certainly. Yeah, so there was my super little nerdy bringing the physics of musical sounds into the way that notes work together and melodies work together. But yeah, the, I think that that, that C one, it's been established in the previous phrase, but two, it does stand out and it, it is someplace different. And I think that whether intentional or not, and in this case with these two, I'm going to think with, with uh, Harold Arlen, I am going to think that that was entirely intentional to make that note stand out. And it, it is, it adds something magical and something different in that little spot. All right. So for our listeners sake, I'm going to go ahead and go through the entire bridge and then out through the final repeat of the main melody. And then we'll quickly discuss the little tag, little coda that's at the end of the entire piece.
again, repeating the exact same melody the third time. No variations in the melody. Again, the harmonies can be a little bit different, but exactly the same notes. So we've now, at this point in the song, before there would normally be, you know, there could be a repeat here and it would go back to the bridge. In this case, we've heard the exact same melody three times. The melody itself has that repeating pattern in it three times. So we've heard the repeating rhythm now nine times in the entire song. And it has a leap repeated three times. So we've heard kind of a leap of either an octave or a sixth nine times by this time in just one repeat of the song without, of course, it seeming as if it is being repetitive or it feeling like it is boring in any way. But I think partly because it's, there's, there's not a lot of length to it. It's two phrases repeated and then a bridge with two phrases and then two phrases when the melody comes back. There's nothing so long that it takes a long time for you to come back and remember things, but also it it doesn't have anything to me that is tedious in any way. No, it, it certainly moves forward. Just before we go on to that coda, I just want to point out something that really supports and you know, substantiates what you were saying earlier about birdsong. I don't know if you can see it there on the screen, but you know, birds fly over the rainbow. Mm-hmm. Why then? Oh, why can't I? And that, that's that's I think there that that suggestion of flight and birdsong really then connotes what we were talking about earlier with buoyancy but also as you said birdsong in the bridge we have mention of birds flying and then you'd have that bird song kind of repeat that's a great mm. observation i hadn't even thought about the fact that the lyrics are talking about birds and then the notes in the melody we're making me, even though he's describes it as being a child's piano exercise, not as insidious as the, all the way up and down playing on the chord, mm. but because he is mentioning it being like a child's piano exercise, to me it felt more, it feels more like birdsong than it feels yeah. like a child's exercise. Having him describe it that way makes me think, oh yeah, that's that's kind of what it sounds like. I think either intentionally or not, it ended up sounding like birds. All right, so let's just go ahead and play that little coda at the end. This brings back that repeating pattern that reminds me of birds. This carries us back out of the entire piece by pulling a little bit of the bridge back in. And let's just listen to this, and then we can talk about what we see in this little coda. Harmonically, I'm just going to point out it's very, very solidly a reinforcement of the key. It's going from one to two to five back to one. So it's a very, very much just, you know, if this were back to classical sonata, it's basically saying harmonically, we're done. Right. Here, I mean, as you mentioned, classical style, I can't help but think of a sonata form <laughs> right now. I know this is an in sonata form, but so often in a piano sonata, the coda addresses material from the development section that wants to be fleshed out a little bit more. And I think in this coda, we see precisely that. I think we see a, a, a union, a synthesis of what we had in the bridge culminating up towards that high E flat, because of course in the bridge we didn't have a single E flat. So for then in the in the coda for it to arrive at an E flat for me is like a synthesis of the first melody and the bridge as well. And you could make a point of it, say, if it's symbolizing flight, you know, taking off, lifting up, liberation, all of that kind of thing. I find it interesting, one of the things I keep saying in this podcast over and over, melodies are stretchy. So we have the very beginning of the melody, in this case, starting on our home note on E flat. And then we have at the very, very end of the melody, the main melody of the song, before we get to the coda, we have it ending on E flat. So it goes all the way up to a high F and it comes all the way back down to E flat. And that kind of stretchiness of of starting someplace and then the melody moves away from that place and it comes back to that place. 
And throughout the structure of the song, that's what happens. But then when we get to this coda, the coda kind of flies away, as it were. You know, we still end up on E flat and E flat an octave up. But to me, it's almost as if it is kind of, you know, I'll just go ahead and go with the, the analogy of a bird, the metaphor of a mm. bird flying away. It's as, as if even it lands up on the home note, it's floated up to the home note an octave away. Yes, I think I'd agree with that. I think something this chat, this this podcast has really highlighted to me is the significance of flight and bird song and a certain freedom associated with bird, you know, birds flying and being able to fly wherever they want. Uh, and ha- just how significant that is as a theme in this song and how it how the music reflects and embodies that. It, it's uh, remarkable. It audibly, it musically is taking us far away, even though it's an octave and it's an octave we've already been to. It's a note we've hit in this song before. But I think the fact that it's ending there and the melody is finally reaching up and stopping there does, it seems to me, to represent that moving off into the distance or dreaming of moving off into the distance. Agreed. And of course, the lyrics here, if happy little bluebirds fly above the rainbow, why oh why can't I? So we've back to the bird song, back to bird reference. Mm. And not only are we having a spot where it sounds like bird song with the, the alternating notes, but we have the birds flying away. Just uh, a question, I suppose. It, it's interesting to me that at the end of phrases in the lyrics, it's a question. And yet we're on the tonic. I just wonder how to interpret that rhetorically as a gesture you know we 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 end a phrase on the question why can't i so often and yet it's on the home chord Mm -hmm. the earlier lyrics are talking about something unknown right so the whole song ends on two questions the first phrase talks about there's a land i've heard of some once in a lullaby the second one says dreams that you dare to dream really do come true and then we have the statement about where you'll find me, you know, all this leading up mm. to being far away and you're going to find me in this far away place. And then, like I said, I think the emotional moment, the strongest emotional moment of the song comes when we get back to somewhere. And at the end of it, rather than it being a statement, like that's where you'll find me in the middle of the song, the song pulls us back to the fact that we aren't there, Mm. that we're still looking for that place somewhere over the rainbow and lamenting that we're not there. And why can't I be there? And this, you know, it fits the emotion of the moment in the movie, of course, where she's dreaming of being in this other place, but it fits in the arc of the song to create the additional longing. There's this place that I've heard of. It, you know, dreams can come true there. You're going to find me there. Why can't I be there? Mm. It takes us back to reality, I think. The reality of the, the black and white world that she, she lives in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it reinforces the longing and it reinforces the, the desire to be someplace else. It reinforces that we're not there. I think that's another important part of the song is that it reaches into us and finds this feeling that really everybody has this feeling of wanting to be able to be someplace better and wanting to find someplace exciting and beautiful and that day-to-day things can be humdrum and mundane. And we're still in that day-to-day stuff and we want to find something that's magical and something that's different and on that note i think we've probably done a really good job of looking at this melody and examining the song i'm happy i've certainly learned a lot about this melody by going through it with you and it's become even more significant (laughs) to me it's amazing to me that we can listen to these melodies over and over and over and not really think about how brilliant the construction of them is and the amazing 
beautiful little magical things that are written into these melodies. And the people that created them, that they created these treasures for us. All right, let's take a break and we will be back and find out more about what's going on with Zachary Davies. Welcome back to the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of melody makers. I am Arthur Brewer, your host, and again, I am here today with composer Zachary Davies. This part of the podcast is talking about what's going on with you. Tell us what's going on, Zach. Lots of things. <laughs> well, I, uh, I've just graduated from my uh, university degree, which you mentioned in the, the opening bio. Uh, and at this point, it's in my life and musical career, if you want to call it that, it's the first moment of total freedom, I suppose you could say, creatively, in that I can choose the projects, really, totally, the, the projects that I want to pursue. The piece I sent you today is a reflection of that, uh, where I really go to town exploring all the things that I love within music. And earlier on, I mentioned about the influences of jazz and classical music on my life. I should mention Dave Brubeck is a, is a particular influence in that regard. I, I think he's an, an incredible musical creator, inventor, if you will. And I'm curious about all kinds of things, experimentation, interpretation, but also melody. I love playing with melody and, and trying to push melody as far as it will go so that it is still melody. But, you know, it, it, hopefully it's in a place that I haven't taken it before. So. Tell us about this piece. This piece I wrote in only a couple of days. It was when I was on a course at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, which was run by the, the wonderful Matthew King. And it started out as a solo work for flute, I believe, and then I changed, edited it to cello. And what you'll hear is an expansion of that piece. Now, there is an experimental side to this in that there is no full score. <laughs> so what this means is essentially each player has their own part. The conductor has the cello part in front of him there in the video and the cues and so on. But essentially, it's up to the conductor's discretion as to when the instruments enter the texture. Each part, I suppose, could be played as a solo piece. It's, it's very melodic. but what the experimental side to it, the, the, the side that's up to the, either the lead performer or the conductor, allows for a certain overlaying of, of textures and of melodies that makes each performance unique, which I think at that particular point in my compositional output, I was, I was extremely interested in. All right. Well, let's listen to this. And what's this called? This is called One Man's Chaos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are going to listen to One Man's Chaos by Zachary Davies.
It's really interesting to hear that in terms of both the structure and the freedom from structure in it, that you, you manage to get both control and chaos into the piece in an, a way, because you have the conductor controlling parts of it, but then the way that the things interact are the chaos. Thank you. The, logistically, it was a nightmare. I mean, you know, trying to find a way of notating what I wanted an ensemble to do, because what I didn't add is that essentially there are no bar lines, right? Except for that middle section. But in that middle section, they're all playing in different time signatures um, <laughs> all at once. It is, it's chaotic. And yet there's some kind of order to it. So when I wrote it as a solo piece, there were no time signatures and that flowed quite well. I mean, you know, you just have a phrase and then another phrase and another phrase and the soloist is able to guide the phrases however they choose. The problem is when you get more than one player at the same time, how do you, how do you navigate that? And that was really the, the, the main challenge. I think for me, the, the joy of writing the piece is knowing what will happen, you know, whether or not it's completely successful each performance, well, it almost doesn't matter because, and in that way, it's liberating. It was liberating because I knew that really then there was more decision-making on the part of the performer. And therefore as a composer, I wasn't listening out for, oh, is that the right note? Is that the wrong note? Is, is this, or, you know, is that right? Or that certainly took some weight off my shoulders and was very fun to write. The other thing I just wanted to, to add there is that I'm also very interested in humor in music. I, I think that there's a lot of humor in, in great music and in, in all kinds, in jazz music as well. It's full of humor very often. And that doesn't mean it can't be serious music. It just means it isn't always solemn. You know, you, you can have humor and still for something to be serious. And, and that ending where they all end on the same F for the first time, which is, is kind of weird, you know, in terms of the texture. You've had all of this flourishing going on they all end in f and the cello plays an f major chord i mean it's <laughs> it's kind of absurd but it's it's a joke really i mean it's, it's just a bit of fun well i think that for example blues as a form very often even though they're the blues they include humor in the lyrics and you know a lot of irony to to uplift from the blues so even though you are in that emotional place, there, is a, there are a lot of situations where the lyrics and the song talk about something that's ironic and funny and contrast to the seriousness of it. Music is about expressing emotions across the spectrum, you know, from happiness to sadness to everything in between, anger. And it's also a situation where the contrast between emotions makes some emotions stronger. Mm. A kind of classic example in Snow White. Snow White, the saddest moment of Snow White is the moment where all of the dwarfs who've been dancing and singing and having so much fun are taking off their hats because Snow White is asleep and you know, can't wake up. That, you know, that sadness that they have that is enhanced by the fact that you've had so much joy up to that point. 
Mm. That the darkness of the moment is only darker because you've had so much brightness before it. So they work hand in hand sometimes, and you can have a piece that's entirely a lament or a piece that's entirely humorous, but without there being contrast between the two, when you add the contrast of something that's different from what it is that you're, you're listening to at a certain moment, it can add so much more emphasis and so much more strength to the other emotion that you're trying to, to get across. I think, as you say, emotional contrast can empower whatever you're trying to express in a way. It, it adds a certain depth, emotionally speaking, uh, as well as gesturally. And this, it kind of takes us full circle to what we were talking about with jazz and the blues at the beginning, you know, asking about my musical origins. And you're absolutely right that some blues music talks about some of the most dire situations about being buried six feet under the ground and all, all the rest of it. And yet there, it, there's a certain resilience and strength to it that I find so uplifting and empowering uh, as a listener and a, as a player that it, I keep going back to listen to more of it. I think a lot of people listen to jazz, they don't realize the depth that is there. People who don't necessarily either understand or they don't themselves connect with jazz. They don't really, I think, know what's there. And I think they don't know what they're missing in terms mm. of what the emotional depth and the emotional breadth of jazz can be. I remember seeing this video by Two Set Violin. I don't know if you've seen any of their, mm. their videos. It's a, a comedy duo of Asian Australian violinists and they're, they're brilliant and, and very funny. And I completely recommend you, you, you check them out. But they, they, you know, they, they go through certain videos and they'll react to them and, and they have an enormous following, you know, millions of subscribers. And they went to a piece by Gershwin. I think it was Gershwin. Uh, it could have been Rhapsody in Blue or the, or the Piano Concerto. And as soon as there was something jazzy, they kind of dismissed it as in, they, as if there was no profundity or, or, or depth to it emotionally. Oh, you know, it's just jazz, they're just having fun. And I just thought, no, you're missing, you're missing the point here with jazz. I mean, it's, you know, the, I, I think it may have been Wynton Marsalis who said it, although I'm not sure I'll have to check later. But, you know, history of jazz is a history of America. And, you know, and I, you know America, like all of the West, is, is, is an in incredible place. It's why people want to live here. But of course, it does have a troubled past as well. And, and this sense of conflict is, is absolutely fundamental to that music. And I think that the music itself transcends that conflict. It doesn't matter where you come from, what you look like, how you grew up, where you grew up. If you, if you can swing, if you can play, you know, you're invited into the group. And in a way, I, I think that jazz represents the, the best side of, of that kind of coming togetherness. That, that you can find in, in the West, uh, at least in a very American way. It's constantly growing, and, and so is its vocabulary. And to take it back to, to melody, because of course this is the <laughs> Melodology podcast, one thing that's also always attracted me to jazz is the fact that very often it sticks with the concept of melody. I think for a long period in the history of classical music, in the 20th century, not so much now, I think melody is, is coming back. But for a long period, melody was seen as a, an old-fashioned idea, old-fashioned concept. But it's always been there in jazz, unapologetically. Uh, and in fact, I think that it's such a strong part of what jazz is, that it's one of the things that speaks to me about it. And that's why in my own music, even though I, you know, I go to the nth degree with melody, I still love writing melody, you know, even if I put four of them together at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, back to the idea of jazz being so intensely melody. When you're learning jazz, if you aren't familiar, if you don't have you know, the songs memorized, have a book of just lead sheets of melodies, mm. you know, a, like a two inch thick book where all it is is the notes of the melody and the chords that go with the melody. And then that becomes whatever the ensemble turns into the entire piece of music. And you'll have however many instruments all get around just the melody notes 
and those chords and turned into something huge and spectacular and filling up the ensemble and the ensemble filling in the space that's available. But all you start with is the melody and the chords that are behind the melody. Mm. And, and so often, I mean, you, you can hear this in the recordings of Chet Baker, for instance, even when the jazz musicians improvise, they're constantly referencing the, the melody at the beginning. They're, it may be an embellishment. It may be a reharmonization. It could be lots of things, but melody is, is such a, a core part of jazz. It, 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 I think I'll always be into jazz because of that. <laughs> what else would you like to share with us today? I'm tempted to write a piece or a collection of pieces for piano, exploring the idea of, of jazz and melody, uh, but in a kind of upside down way, you know, try, trying to not reinvent the wheel because that's, that would just be awful. Uh, but, but just try to explore how melody can be developed and taken to the extreme within solo piano music. Of course, solo piano is, I, I find, even as a pianist, I find it extremely difficult to write for solo piano. I, I think because not only you have to take into account playability and also the textures and things like that, I think to a further degree than you do with an ensemble, I, I find that if I stick to what we're talking about with melody, I, 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 I'd be excited to see what comes out of it. Anything else you'd like to share? Well, maybe I could just uh, do a little medley of Somewhere Over the Rainbow just to finish us off, you know. For, that sounds great. If you'd like something like that. I would love that. Yeah. Okay. Just a melody. I'll see what I can do. Thank you for sharing that. That was a delight. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure discovering this melody with you. So where can people find you online? 
Well, I uh, inhabit several social media realms. Uh, I am on Twitter and Instagram at uh, Z Davies Music. Uh, and I'm also on, on YouTube where you can find uh, just a couple of random, a random assortment of things from uh, the odd performance to uh, interviews that I've done as videos rather than just purely audio podcasts. Uh, and yeah, that you can find me there. Feel free to write if you if you'd like to get in touch. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. And I will point out to our American audience that when you say Z Davies music, you're actually saying Z Davies music as how we would pronounce it. It's not spelled out Z E D. Uh, that's how Brits pronounce the letter Z. So Z. I know we're we're Davies so weird. We're, we're... Music. <laughs> We're a weird bunch on this side of the pond. Delightful. And I am Arthur Brewer. I am your host. Arthur, B-R-E-U-R. It's five letters and the last three letters look like Europe. And that's me on all social media. And this has been the Melodology Podcast at melodologypodcast.com. And on the social medias and on Patreon, just as Melody Podcast. Thank you for joining us today on the Melodology Podcast, celebrating the unsung excellence of Melody Makers. Look forward to having you back at the next podcast.